I think the problem we have with AI is artificial intelligence that says that the machines actually own the intelligence. I don't believe that at all. We should call it enhanced intelligence because chat GPT and the large language models and AI today are actually a collection of the data and humanity and intelligence of us. If you were to use only one social media platform from now on, which one would you use? I don't think you need to use one social media channel and I'll tell you why. By creating content on that one channel, that channel is rented land for you as a creator. So what you need to be is multi-channel that you own because you can be banned from Facebook, you can be banned from TikTok, you can be banned from Instagram, be banned from any social media. If a person can read, write and speak well, becoming a digital marketer can be a natural choice? Yeah, being a good digital marketer comes out to being creative. A digital marketer in the past is all about copywriting. Now it's about short form video. I think curiosity is actually a very important thing from digital marketers. Will this message resonate? Will this email marketing campaign work? Will this video go viral, which is hard to do? And actually absorbing a lot of different ideas from content marketers, digital marketers, is actually the first place you need to start from. Hello everyone, this is Shubham Tiwari. I'm the head of content marketing and socials at Philo, the universal API for creator data. And I welcome you to the second season of Impulse, Google's top rated podcast on influencer marketing. Today, I'm thrilled to host Mr. Jeff Bullas, a legend in the field of digital marketing. Yeah. Jeff is the founder of Side Hustle Strategies. It is a learning platform that covers best practices in sales, marketing, lead generations, and related things. With numerous accolades from Forbes to Huffington Post, Jeff has helped countless businesses and creators shine online. He's a top tier speaker, author, consultant, known for his engaging storytelling style and innovative ideas. He also runs The Jeff Buller Show, a podcast where he interviews AI startup founders and entrepreneurs. So if you are one, please hit him up. But for now, let us welcome Jeff. Uh, welcome, Jeff, to the second season of Impulse. Thank you very much. I'll just actually let a little edit to that introduction in that my claim to fame and where I started was jeffbullis.com. Side Hustle Strategies was a, I suppose, a side hustle, but jeffbullis.com is where I mainly play and that's where we mainly. So if you want to find me, it will be at jeffbullis.com, actually. So, and on different platforms like Twitter. Now called X. Yep. Uh, Elon Musk is just trying to confuse us, really. And that's my handle is at Jeff Bullis. Instagram, at Jeff Bullis. So, yeah, I couldn't think of anything, any other way to actually play except just call my, give my name out. So it's fine. Great. So we'll put all these links in the description of the video. JeffBullis.com and all the handles where you can connect with Jeff. Let's start on a fun note. Give me your most controversial hot take on AI in influence marketing. Which one would you like me to choose? Influencer marketing or AI? I can go to, okay, let's go to influencer marketing because that's something I actually think that, I think there's two levels of influencer marketing. Number one is what I call the Insta-famous type influencers, which I call create a lot of superficial content. In other words, look great in a bikini, look fantastic until they don't because they get a bit older. The other part, so for me, influencer marketing, and I started a blog about social media back in 2009 and influencer marketing wasn't even a phrase back then, right? It was content marketing and you created content that actually had conversations around what I call meaningful, deep content. And so for me, influencer marketing can be quite superficial because what we've discovered over the years is that social media, for example, the algorithm of social media is all about creating drama and about creating anything. So Mr. Beast, fantastic drives a lot of content, but it's all about drama. And does he actually teach anyone anything? Does he actually make a difference except entertain? So I think there's two parts to influencer marketing. I think there's entertainment and then there's actually making a difference with deep content. So that's the influencer part. Right. Wrap on that. Now that's some hot take uh, for the creators as well as everyone. I think AI has two aspects to it. One created by Hollywood, dystopia. In other words, the machine's going to take over humanity. We're going to all die. The machine's going to kill us, right? That's dystopian. Yeah. Then we have utopia. In other words, AI is going to make a big difference to the world. It's going to make us better. It's enhanced intelligence. I think the problem we have with AI is that definition, or I suppose twist on that tale, is that 
Artificial intelligence says that actually the machines actually own the intelligence. I don't believe that at all. I really think that we should call it enhanced intelligence because chat GPT and the large language models and AI today are actually a collection of the data and humanity and intelligence of us. Yep. And what's, what's happened is that reality is that large language models actually scrape the web and actually then collect human intelligence, human creativity, and then try and distill that and make it into a production of content. So the reality for me is that it's actually not artificial. It's actually human intelligence, Yeah. but curated by the machine because we're in the middle of a very interesting time in that what we have is we have so much data that as humans trying to make sense of that, and as humans, we're a pattern recognition machines. So trying to make sense of that is actually really a big challenge. So what's great about AI is that, and I would rather use the word AI, enhanced intelligence. How can we use the hu- intelligence of the planet, the intelligence of humans, the creativity of humans that can be collected by the machines to add, make us more human? So there's my two takes on influencer marketing or influencers and AI. Wonderful. The influencer marketing take is truly a hot take for everyone to think about the kind of content and its impacts. So you're you're clearly not a team, uh, Mr. Elon Musk, when it comes to the dystopian view of AI, right? Well, Elon Musk wants it both ways. Interesting. Okay. So he says AI is going to kill us. AI can be dystopian. And then on the other hand, he launches Grok, which is a competitor to ChatGPT. Yep. So Mr. Elon Musk, very smart, great entrepreneur. The issue that I have with Elon is that he beats up the people that he left, ChatGPT. He was on the board in 2015. Yeah. He leaves them and goes, you guys are really popular now. I actually want to be back in the game. So he starts Grok. And then in the meantime, he says, AI is going to kill everyone. But guess what? Elon Musk is very, very intuitive. And also he understands how the influencer marketing game works. If I've got 150, 200 million people on my platform, I can play the game and actually make it work for me. So do I have a, look, I think he's an incredibly gifted entrepreneur, very smart dude. So what he's trying to do is attention first, sanity second, right? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a very interesting thing to say, like he's really good at influencer marketing and he's a good marketer as well. He knows how to grab attention, as you mentioned. Wonderful. So now... Let's come back to Jeff Bullis and your blog covers everything from SEO to influencer marketing. And I was just telling you before the recording that my team was really excited that I'm talking to you. Your blog is such so good and so famous. How did you build such a loyal following? Because you were also mentioning like, you know, Google's algorithm play, which is getting more and more complex. How did you navigate that? And where is it headed now? In 2009, I went out with a, with a lady for a couple of months and she said you need to get on Facebook this is 2008 actually and I went wow so I got onto Facebook in 2008 and then I got into Twitter in 2008 and I went wow this connects me with the world actually I could bypass the gatekeepers of media yeah the news.coms CNNs whatever you want to call it right but the reality the reason I got onto social media well i was introduced to social media. And then I was actually fascinated. I was curious about social media. And I believe that I was really excited the fact that it would give me a voice to reach the world by bypassing the gatekeepers. Now let's let's think about where we were in 2009. The Apple iPhone had just come out. The smartphone had actually started to rise. And what we had was we had the intersection of, of two technologies which became a perfect storm, social media and the smartphone. So in 2009, we all became publishers and we could actually publish anywhere. But at that time, we still didn't have what we called a selfie camera on those phones. Yep. So the reality for me back then was I was very curious about the ability of social media to connect me with the world, to see people I hadn't seen in decades because they were my colleagues, because Facebook started as a college university social media event. In other words... You could talk about that, but then they opened it to the world. So for me, I was excited because suddenly social media gave me a voice. Before that, you had to pay for attention, mass media. So what happened was my curiosity became compelling. Then it became an obsession. And then that's how the world unfolded for me. So what happened was as I wrote what I was curious about, and for four years, I actually wrote an article every day 
before I started my day job. It was a side hustle Okay. for four years. I got up at 4.30 a.m. and wrote before I started my day job at 9 a.m. It's almost like 1,500 days you wrote every day. Yes. Wow, Stephen King would be really proud of you, sir. And what I discovered by writing was that I fell in love with words and I fell in love with writing. Right. But this actually then plugged into my inclination and obsession and my passions, right? And Stephen King, you just tapped into, you mentioned Stephen King. Stephen King said, if you want to write a lot, you need to read a lot. There is no other way. True. So at the age of five or six, I learned to read. I went to school and then I became the librarian's best friend because during lunch times I would drop in and I would borrow books. In fact, maximizing my book count borrowing capacity was not unusual. So it was my secret passion that 50 years later, at the age of 50, I actually leaned into. So for me, what I found fascinating was that, and this, is, this also comes out of Joseph Campbell, who wrote The Hero's Journey, yeah. and was the inspiration behind Star Wars, one of the most successful movie series of all time. So what I found fascinating about that for me was that Joseph Campbell said there is none of us have a a purpose that is built into us or we need to actually try and find. Well, maybe we do, but what he said was, as humans, we need to follow our bliss. And I'll put that into three simple steps. Number one, what are you curious about? Then create something out of that and then share it with the world. And then the world will show up. And that's what happened for me in 2009. I actually was curious about social media. I created articles, I wrote, and then I shared it with the world because at that time, social media was new. And what was really, really cool about that time, it was the wild west of social media. There were no algorithms. It was raw. It was wild west. Yeah. So you weren't constrained and restrained by the social media algorithms. You also weren't constrained and restrained by the algorithms of search. What happened was that I leaned into Twitter, for example, and started writing and sharing on Twitter. And I worked out how to actually grow my Twitter following. So within about two or three years, I had 500,000, half a million Twitter followers. But what was great was the algorithms actually, they were quite raw. In other words, but what's happened since then in 2013, 14, Facebook went public. So what they were intrigued about that by then was actually trying to get you, well, they were about making money. They weren't about letting you connect with your tribe. I had this tribe on Twitter that was just viral. It just worked. And what we have today is that the algorithms of 2013, 14 that rose out of Facebook, Instagram, TikTok now is that we have, the problem we have is that the algorithms don't serve the creators unless you're dramatic, unless you yeah. share hate and disinformation. What it does, it serves the advertising revenue of the social media platforms. So if I really want to break through, I need to be create shit content, misinformation, disinformation, and share hate and drama. And, and this is leading to the breakdown of democracy, it's leading to the breakdown of truth. So we're living in a very interesting time, but I grew up in the wild west of social media right so that's a long answer to your question but that's what's happened for me right so if i can take out you know like why did jeff buller's blog you know is one of the best why is it the best and how is it you know continue to be most coveted one is you just simply be good at what you're doing find your bliss and do your thing don't try to be sensational dramatic or try to be you know in tune with what's working on certain algorithm right now you just do you know what you what you like with with passion and one more thing as you mentioned you know, joseph campbell that's exactly why we uh, you know named our youtube channel thousand faces club he wrote well, thousand exactly. faces. yep so that's a simple interesting aside one question if do you, if you were to use only one social media platform platform from now on which one would you use and why I don't think you need to use one social media channel and I'll tell you why. Okay. The problem is that if you use one social media channel and you share content on that, the challenge is that by creating content on that one channel, that channel is rented land for you as a creator. So what you need to be is multi-channel, but what you need to do is you need to have a home base that you own because you can be banned from Facebook, you can be banned from TikTok, you can be banned from Instagram, you can be banned from any social media. In fact, I had one channel I started on Reddit that said I started a subreddit channel just a week ago. I was experimenting. And within a few days, it got banned. 
and I did wow. not create yeah. any okay. content that was an issue. Very careful, very considered, very professional. But I think somehow the algorithm got in the way or a competitor decided to complain. The issue we have now is that you, you need to be multi-channel, but you also need to own your content. So I have my domain, jeffbullis.com, that is my domain. But I then need to distribute that to the channels. Right. Right. And the channels ebb and flow. TikTok's hot now. Instagram reels became hot. Video became hot. Articles written weren't, were not, were great initially. So you've got to be very careful by playing on rented land. And that is social media is your distributor. And the, on top of that then is you can create a lot of content, rank high on Google. Then Google will change the algorithms. Right. Not not to serve humanity, but to serve basically profitability. Yeah, right. You're right. Rented land. Speaking of your experience or expanding on your experience of Reddit, what's one piece of content you created that you thought would work well, but did not perform it as you expected? And what were your learnings from it? Okay. So I originally was using Reddit to share what I call long form content. Reddit likes questions. So I created a subreddit recently and it was about how to create a side hustle. So I created some long form content as a bit of a foundation. And then I actually just asked some questions like, has anyone made any money using AI as a way to actually create a business? And I shared that on a couple of platforms and my subreddit got banned. And I'm going, really? So not controversial, no issue. So I moved, my former content is usually long form and deep rather than short and superficial. Right. So, you know, for me, I created distribution with Twitter. That was how I actually got to reach the world a lot. But then what I was doing is I created headlines that actually then had a link to longer content, which was to my blog. And that's how Twitter served me until the algorithms then didn't work because yeah. the algorithms of social media were all about maximizing the platform revenue not in creating tribes and giving those that actually make a difference to the world. So if you sense a slight bit of disenchantment and skepticism about social media, you're correct. Because I believe that social media is, is a two-edged sword. It's both something that is great for the common good in that we all can get a voice out to the world. On the other hand, the algorithms are designed to actually give people attention that share misinformation, hate and drama. Because guess what? Most people click on something that is clickbait. Yeah. So for me, I was asked to speak in about 2019 at the World Youth Forum in Egypt. 10,000 young people showed up and I was at the round table for, hosted by the president of Egypt. And we had two sides to the table. We all given three minutes. There was the pros of social media and there were the, you know, those for and against of social media, right? So we had two sides to the table here. And for me, I heard the... And on one side were those that actually were academics that were researching the negative impacts. People, you know, young people that were being impacted by hate and shaming on social media. And the other side were those entrepreneurs, actually, social media was their way to actually share their information. So for me, that was actually a watershed moment in terms of the impact of social media. And I went, we need to be very careful about how we use social media. So for me, in 2019, my exposure to the fours, the positives and the negatives of social media was, a, was quite revealing. And for me today, I actually don't hardly ever get onto a social media platform and scroll. Yeah, you just continue to use your thumb. Yeah. And I, I'm going to tell you two reasons why I don't do that. Number one, it comes from a term which was from a, a friend of mine. She said to me, we judge our insides by the outsides of others. Okay. So if you go to an Instagram feed, a Facebook feed, all you see is a shiny outside of others. Yeah. They're sharing their best life. Filtered photos. Yeah. Yep. So number one, when I watch my colleagues in America, they're going, I'm speaking at all these conferences. I'm doing all this. I'm famous. I'm fabulous. Fantastic. Right. But behind that facade sits a lot of things. Number two, the other issue I have with social media is it wastes our time on superficial shit. In other words, we are watching someone kiss a dog in Cappadocia, Turkey, right? Yep, and we don't even remember it, you know, the next moment. <laughs> Look, it's funny, it's great, it's entertaining. But if your life is all about just being entertained by superficial stuff, then you've got a problem. Right. So number one, I think 
The reality is that if you spend too much on social media, you feel like you're inadequate. Number two, it's going to waste your time. And what do you need to do? You need to actually go, you need to lean back and going, how can I make a difference in the world? Do I need to create great content or do I need to waste people's time with superficial content? So anyway, there's my two takes on social media. And I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just how you use it. Right. You're clearly not a fan of short form videos at all. Like, I don't think, have you ever used TikTok? I mean, yeah, yeah. of course Look, you have. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So now I'm using short form content. And for me, my media of choice was writing. Okay. Right. So when video became, you know, the most important thing, it's great, right? Yeah. On the other hand, I like crafting words. So what I do do though is I have the podcast, but what I do is I actually publish on YouTube long form video. Right. Then I use AI to actually try and distill that long form video into short video that we share on YouTube Shorts, Instagram Reels, and TikTok. So we are we are using it. But I really can't be bothered spending all my day creating short form video. Right. Because so I've got other things I'd rather do, like go for a bike ride. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> but, where, are you, yeah. where are you planning to go next on your bike? And which bike do you have? I have a giant uh, carbon bike called Giant TCR Advanced. Uh, my next bike ride is in the Dolomites in September next year. I will maybe do a bike ride in New Zealand, uh, Alps to Ocean, which is actually most fabulous one of the most fabulous countries in the world is New Zealand, to ride from the Alps to the ocean. Because I'm a little concerned with social media actually creating an artificial life. We actually don't get out of our, right. off our phones and actually go and experience life. So for me, it's about experiencing life. But guess what? I'm a little older than the average 20, 30 something. And that's, that's me. So yep. I'm a little concerned sometimes by the obsession with the smartphone and people's use of it in that they live entirely their almost entire life on the smartphone. Right. I was driving back from the movies the other night. I, I do get out occasionally, not riding. Okay. And there was a guy on a bike in the middle of the road checking out his smartphone at 11 p.m. at night. In the middle of the road? Yep. Wow. You must be creating some content. He <laughs> must be. <laughs> All sorts of, you know, daredevils are out there. So, yeah. Anyway, I, I address my case. I think we actually need to be create authentic experiences. We need to get out. We need to actually live. We need to we need to listen. We need to be engaged, not with our smartphones, but with life. Right. Hear the birds, smell the roses, and all that stuff. Great. I'll come to the, you know, content distribution strategies using AI, which you mentioned, like when you write long form, then you use AI to distribute it. But before that, do you think if a person can read, write and speak well, becoming a digital marketer can be a natural choice? Or or if I reverse the question, a digital marketer, should he or she be a good writer or reader in the first place? I think digital marketers, you know, being a good digital marketer comes out to being creative. So I think for me, look, a digital marketer in the past is all about copywriting. Now it's about short form video as well as copywriting. So I think just, and also a good digital marketer will also be someone that is intrigued by digital marketing, right? So I'm not necessarily intrigued by digital marketing and writing. Can I write a good headline, for example? That's, that's great. Can I write good copy? But what's really interesting that's happening right now with AI, for example, is that AI can actually scrape the web, put together a 50 week email marketing campaign with a few prompts. So in the middle of that is it's really interesting in that I think being curious about how that will work. So I think curiosity is actually a very important thing from digital marketers. Wow. Okay. Will this message resonate? Will this email marketing campaign work? Will this video go viral, which is hard to do? And so for me, I think sitting down and actually absorbing a lot of different ideas from, you know, great content marketers, digital marketers is actually the first place you need to start from. You need to start from curiosity. Right. Wonderful. Creativity and curiosity will keep you up to date. Do you think humor and memes play a huge role in digital marketing today? Are we overemphasizing on them or... Or not like are they really central to building your own brand or your strategies i think creating memes and also creating great video that actually creates attention the challenge we have today is there's so much noise 
and we're talking 8 billion people, six, I think 6 billion people on smartphones today, are all trying to get attention. So I think trying to break through is hard. So in other words, I think having your own voice is very, very important. Cracking the code but going viral is something that I was obsessed with, especially with in a text-based environment, you know, 10 years ago. But headlines are also important for video content as well. So I agonize over the headlines for any article that I write or create. But yeah, memes are important. Trying to crack the code of the algorithms. I think we're in the middle of the battle of the algorithms. Yep. So how does the algorithm work on TikTok? Different to how it works on Instagram Reels. How does the algorithm work on Facebook? It works until it doesn't. Like BuzzFeed, for example, in 2017 yep. was just amazing. Yeah. Then Facebook changed the algorithm. No, it's not. Now they're losing money. So we have this fast changing environment that is a challenge for all of us as marketers, as content creators, as video creators, as writers. So it is overwhelming. Right. I think AI can help us scale that, but we're also trying to work out how we use AI in the most effective way. I grew up in the wild west of social media back in 2008, no, nine. And it, look, I had, you know, the most amazing experience with that. I leaned into the wild west and it worked for me until it didn't because I discovered I love writing. So I didn't become a meme player. I didn't become a video creator. I'm now using AI to help me do that. But the reality is I'm an old school blogger, right? Bloggers were hot in 2010 until they weren't. Yeah. Now that's all about being a hot TikToker, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, I can look back with 15 years of experience into this space and I'm going, God, it's exhausting. Right, Do right. I want to become a TikToker? Do you want to create drama? Do you want to, you know, I'm just going, I'm a different phase of life to 20, 30 something. And that's fine. I'm trying to create the best content I have that I'm curious about that I'm following my bliss, which is a Joseph Campbell term, and I am quite comfortable there. I am not going to be a famous TikToker because it's a different game. Yeah, totally, of course. Which is your favourite Western film? Western film, okay. So X-Men and Wolverine, I just watched the other night. That was pretty cool. Okay, Deadpool and Wolverine. Deadpool, sorry, Deadpool and Wolverine. <laughs> yeah. But then there was I an mean, article. I meant the Western genre. I mean, the Western genre of filmmaking. The Sam Peckinpahs of the world and good, bad and the uglies. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, look I, I go between French films and Hollywood. Okay. Yeah. So I, I've got, what's the best Western movie? Are you a film buff? You guys I have got have Bollywood. Asked, asked Americans question. have got Hollywood. So for me, I suppose, there's, because I have a very general taste, I actually have, a, I love a lot of entertainment. So mm. it could be like Deadpool and Wolverine was both violent but incredibly funny. Mm. And like on the other hand, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other movies I can't remember off the top of my head. But I I'll try different stuff. Sometimes it might be okay. You like Star Wars? So what Star Wars? Look, yeah. I love I love science fiction. Okay. I like uh, Iron Man, for example. Oh, nice. That's yeah. that's great. Good yeah. Taste. So so what I love okay. So what I love about Star Wars is that it was inspired by. Joseph Campbell. You might yep. have taken him a little bit of a fanboy of Joseph Campbell. But right. what I love about that is Joseph Campbell inspired Star Wars. And what worked was because, and this is what I do even my podcast, I actually I say to people, I say, okay, so what inspired you to go from ordinary to extraordinary? What made you cross the threshold? Because you go to the start of Star Wars, right? It's like Luke Skywalker had an ordinary life on Earth, but he was called had a calling and he crossed the threshold to start the adventure. Then what did he learn along the way? Who were his mentors? What did he learn? And then we, if we just encapsulate that in a very short story arc of the hero's journey is what does he bring back to the world? So for me, when I listen to any entrepreneur, when I talk to anyone, I'm going, okay, what was your inspiration to start the journey you're on today? What he learned? What have you learned? Who were your mentors? What were the books or even the people that helped you? And what do you bring back to the world that changes the world and makes a difference? And for me, that actually is woven into almost everything I do today when I create and share online is that right. can I make the world a better place? Do you think you have made the digital marketing landscape a better place because of your work? I hope so. I remember as a conference about seven or eight years ago and I went to a conference in Dublin and a young guy came up to me and said, Jeff, I read your blog 
and what you shared about social media. He said, today I have a 30 person social media digital marketing agency. You changed my life. And I went, you know what? That is so great to hear because somehow I inspired him to start and to make a difference and to change his life. And then along the way, he's changed other people's lives. So for me, I've had these anecdotal, you know, sharing from people at conferences around the world. And just for one or two of those means I've made a difference. And that for me is, it's amazing. I started this out of a curiosity about social media and the belief that it allowed me to reach the world and make a difference. And I think today we can do that, whether it's on TikTok, whether it's with video, whether it's writing, but I created what I call the freedom code. Okay. And, and the freedom code is five pillars, just five. Number one, discover why you're here. In other words, what is your bliss? What are you curious about? Number two, create from that. Number three, share it with the world. Number four, what you need to do then is actually, how can, will the world pay me for this? In other words, monetize it. And number five, how can we amplify it? So for me, I think for everyone, and it's not for everyone maybe, but for me, that is what I've discovered along the way. It's called the Freedom Code. And I'll just quickly sum it up. Number one, why are you here? Number two, create something out of that, whether it's a product, whether it's an e-commerce, whether it's writing, whether it's a video, share that. Number three, share that with the world. Number four, will the world pay me for this? Number five, once you work out if the world will pay you for that, is actually to amplify that. So it's not all about the money. It's actually coming from a place of curiosity and passion and purpose. And what I love about Joseph Campbell is said, follow your bliss. And follow your bliss is actionable. It's not static. A lot of people have great ideas, but they actually never do anything with their ideas. They don't create and they don't share. And the other challenge we have within the second step on create is that the problem with creating for people that don't actually share it with the world is say, like you might have the best idea in the world. You might create something, which is the best thing, but you put it in your filing cabinet and you never give it the light of day. So we all need as humans to actually put it out into the world because that's the only place where you'll make a difference. Wonderful. You're clearly very inspired by Joseph Campbell. Who are <laughs> other people that you look up to, your mentors or other people in your life? I think Steve Jobs inspires me. He actually shares a birthday of mine, February 24. The other thing that's really cute, really great about you know, Steve Jobs is he, he was true to himself. And I think that's really important is that as an individual, a lot of us follow you know, the set templates and requirements of society and culture, religion, family. And you know, a lot of people say, when I grow up, I want to be like you know, ABC or this person. My mantra is, when I grow up, I want to be me. So I think the challenge for all of us is trying to work out who we are. But I think we need to look at things like, what am I curious about? Then start creating, investigating, reading. Then does that become compelling? Then does that become an obsession that changes your life? And a lot of people die with their song unspoke, unsaid, right? Because they've never acted on their curiosity. And as humans, we're curious. We, we as children, we are so curious. We play we create, we sing, we dance, right? I think as humans, we need, as adults, we need to continue to sing and dance. True. Couple of uh, rituals we make our guests go through at the, you know, in the third act of in the, our interviews. First of all, you will love this. Give us your top three books of all time. Okay. My first book that inspired me was by Tolkien, which is Lord of the Rings. Wow. Okay. Love it. Yeah. Okay. So I read 65 to 70 books a year. So I'm trying to pick one out of that. So you read almost one and a half or two books each week. Yes. Wow. The other book I've read recently, which I think I would put into one of my top ones is, is by Charlie Munger, who died at the age of 99 last year. The sidekick, in fact, the partner of Warren Buffett. Yeah. From yeah. Berkshire Hathaway. He wrote a book called Poor Charlie's Almanac. Right. And for me, that was inspiring because it was a person who lived for 99 years. It encapsulated the wisdom. He said that one of the things that he's used over the years is to create mental models, which go right across the spectrum of humanity, psychological, maths, economics, entrepreneurship. So for me, Poor Charlie's Almanac was a revelation. The other book I would say was the book called Deep Work. 
in other words, I think it's really important that as humans, we need to create something that matters. And I think, you know, for me, that those three books, look, I'm not saying they're the only three books because I've, yeah, but along the way, I've read books on pirates and I've read yeah. books on adventure, but yeah. So there's three books. Wonderful. I, I love books on sea voyages, Moby Dick and uh, yep. Endurance. These books are just so inspiring. Last ritual, would you like to nominate anyone for our show so that we can continue to have wonderful conversations like this? Uh, nominate someone for your show. If you want to talk to a big mind, and I interviewed him this year, is Nick Bostrom, who wrote Super Intelligence in 2014 and then wrote Deep Utopia this year. Nick Bostrom is a polymath. Okay. In other words, his interests lie across the spectrum in terms of knowledge from neuroscience to physics to maths to economics. I was fascinated to interview him. And for me, he's a, I suppose, an inspiration in terms of he imagines a world unimagined, which stretches my mind. And one of the reasons I read is to have my mind stretched because I believe that the challenge we have as humans is trying to escape the boxes we are born into culture, religion, family, templates. And I, you know, for me, I certainly feel that within me lies the universe. How can I break out of the box that, you know, I was born into, I was surrounded by and grew up into. So for me, the reality is that I think within all of us lies genius. Just trying to find out our own genius is where the magic really happens. Jeff Bullas, thank you so much for today's conversation. So many wisdom nuggets came out of it for marketers, for creators, and for people in general who are interested in books, literature, life, philosophy. Would have loved to pick your brain for another hour, but I'm sure you're a busy man. So thank you so much for uh, whatever you have done. As I mentioned in the introduction, you're a legend and it was a true pleasure for me to speak with you. And thank you on the behalf of all the young digital marketers. We look up to you and we wish you the best in whatever you're pursuing right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure and a joy. And uh, I would say to anyone, follow your bliss. There you go. So, of course, this was a really helpful interview. So let us know what you thought of particular wisdom nuggets that resonated with you. Connect with Jeff on LinkedIn, Twitter, or wherever you are comfortable. And yeah, please let us know what you thought of this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you. Impulse, the influencer marketing podcast is brought to you by Philo. Philo is the easiest way to get access to authenticated creator data from hundreds of different platforms. To know more about Philo, visit getphilo.com. That's get, P-H-Y-L-L-O.com. Also, make sure to search for Influencer Marketing Podcast in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or any of your favorite podcast listening platforms. And don't forget to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Philo, thank you so much for listening.